Hey everybody, it's James Chai here. Uh, I'm just going to get set up here on my thing, but I thought I would um, just talk about uh, a couple things today. So um, I, I, I've uh, I've heard that again, that I, I went on to many topics the other day just because uh, of that. So it got a little bit complicated for people to understand. And so I'm going to break it down again. Um, and one of the biggest questions that people have for me uh, it seemed to be was how do you stop your dog from barking at the window? How do you stop the dog from barking at noises outside, etc., etc.? So um, in the description section, I've written down um, what it is I'm going to go over. I'm going to try to stick to that, and then I will um, try to uh, explain everything out here. So, so the big question. Hi, Anthony. Hi, Anthony. Okay, go, 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 please. Okay, so um. The, the biggest thing is people talk about having the um, your dog barking at the window, right? Anthony, stop. Go. Um, and as you can see there, as I'm talking to Anthony, I'm using regular language with him. And using regular language, conversational language, it's extremely important to use uh, when speaking with your dog. Because, again, conversational language, Minky, stop. Uh, conversational language, Minky, Minky. So conversational, hi Colleen, uh, conversational language is important to have when you are talking to your dog, no matter what. It is, it's, guys, uh, so that way, um, it, it allows them to understand that they're part of the family, uh, understand them that you're part of, they're part of your family, etc. End of the day, your dog hears you talking to other people. They hear your conversation. So we always, and I always, always, always absolutely encourage people to talk conversationally and not talk in a high-pitched type of voice like hi how are you and and all that because it's disingenuous dogs don't speak to themselves in in odd ways like that and we always want to keep things somewhat consistent so yeah i know he does miki and and that i think they're figuring out that this, that this cell phone uh video is uh is taking away the attention that they need um okay so how do we stop the dog from barking out at the window what are they doing why are they barking and and a lot of times the motivation is okay you know give them a break, distract their attention etc etc so um, when you're talking about dysfunctional dog it's a much more serious type of situation because it's a psychologically rooted aspect of it and the dog does not necessarily usually respond to to food or treats because again if they're in a deeper seated uh, dysfunction it just isn't going to happen. And I want to make it clear that everything that I talk about in this post, previous posts, future posts, it's always about dysfunctional dogs. It's always about dogs that are, um, are uh, well, you know, dangerous to extremely dangerous to predatorial. And um, uh, even just, anyways, just, just I work on a different scale. I'm not trying to be a jerk to, to my colleagues. I'm just saying that I, that's just where I'm comfortable in that niche. And, uh, um, so I'm going to go on that part. So barking at the window, barking out the window, you know, barking at the noises outside. How do we get this to stop? How do we get these dogs of ours to stop driving us nuts, so to speak? First thing to remember is that when our dog is barking out the window, they're barking out to warn away bad things, bad people, bad animals, potential predators that could possibly come into your home, into their home, into our home. So that's why the dog goes out there to the window to bark off and go, ah, stay away, stay away, stay away. The one aspect about dogs is that they exist in a defensive measure at almost all types and times of their life. Because they're out there to protect themselves. They want to make sure that they're safe. They want to make sure that the rest of the pack is safe. Similar to what I was saying yesterday in regards, or the last couple of days, in regards to, you know, if your dog is on a leash and someone attacks your dog, and you pull your dog away, how you present it is whether or not your dog is feeling that you're part of it and you're helping to protect them or not. Okay, so um, when your dog is barking out the window, they are basically saying to the outside noises that they hear that we don't hear. There's a danger, something that doesn't sound normal, that the ambient sound doesn't sound normal to them. And it sounds odd. It's that little bit of, you know, if you listen to someone's voice and sometimes they're talking and all of a sudden they have a little bit of strain, you're like, Oh, kind of talked a little odd today. So what we want to do is we want to address the fact that the dog is defending our home. 
So a lot of people will get upset and they'll go and say, stop yelling, and they'll start yelling at their dog and so forth like that. And to a point, it's it's good to do, and I'll explain in a little bit, and, I, and I, I've written it down on my little, little sheet of paper, so I have some structure today. Uh, but it again is that the dog is trying to defend our home, our property. And why is he doing that? Or why is she barking out at every single little noise that's outside that may be impacting them? Because your dog is showing not only are they defending your home, our home, your dog is also showing that they are earning their position in your home. Now, we're not talking about a dominant aspect of it. As I said yesterday, there's I don't believe in any such terminology as dominance. Um, if the dog was going to be dominant, he would basically attack a person in the home if he wanted to dominate you. So it's, it's not that part of it. It's just that part where the anxieties and so forth pick up. Anyhow, uh, long story short, your dog is trying to establish their position and prove to you that they are earning their keep in your home. They are proving that they belong with your family, that they belong as part of your family. And as long as they're doing the barking, they're saying, hey, you know what? There's a noise out there. I'm letting you know, and I'm showing you that I'm doing my job. So what do we do? Well, uh, let's see, barking at the window, not dominance, defense, okay, earning position. All right, so the next thing that I always say to everybody is let your dog bark. For a couple of seconds, maybe a minute at the most, 30 seconds is fine. Let your dog bark. Let your dog get it out of their system. That's what they're doing. And so if we try to suppress the dog from being able to bark and express himself, or herself and, and, and to suppress them from being able to just exhibit out the aggression or the, the, the defensive measures, then your dog feels somewhat devalued because now we're saying, well, you're not doing your job and we'll, we, we don't think you're important. We don't think you're having any value. Um, so what you want to do is let your dog bark for about, again, upwards of a minute. But again, I would keep it to about 30 seconds. And then that's when you step in. And then you say what I always say to my guys, stop yelling. I'm always using human terminology. I'm always using human conversation for a couple of reasons. One, because when we're talking to our dogs and we're talking to people, we want to keep everything consistent because to you, he may be a dog, but to your dog, you're part of their family. So if we maintain the same conversation that we have with our family and we have the same type of conversation with our dog, your dog feels inclusive, your dog feels fuller in self-confidence, self-esteem, self-worth. Those are dysfunctions that I'm going to talk about at some other time. Um, so again, don't go and yell out and say, stop barking and yelling. At stop yelling. And again, you'll use a full voice. Stop yelling. Stop yelling that kind of voice. So that way you're not straining your voice, you're not getting upset, you're not doing anything that's out of sorts. You're just basically saying, stop yelling. I've recognized that you're doing it. Just stop yelling. And of course, in the first few times, you know, first week or so, your dogs won't have any idea what you're doing because they're like, huh? Why are you talking to me like people? What you do then is when your dog doesn't stop yelling, you go over and you walk over to your dog and walk up to them in just a very casual manner like you're just... Oh, Please stop. You're just irritating me. Because then your demeanor and your tone of voice will be reflected in the way you're speaking to your dog. So then you just walk over to them as they're barking and you just say, stop yelling. Stop yelling. And then your dog will be like, what? What are you doing? And they'll look at you and they'll start looking out the window more and they'll start barking more because they're saying to you, okay, let's keep barking at the noise outside. Let's keep barking at the danger and telling them to stay away. What you basically do then is you tell them to stop barking, right? So you say, stop yelling and then you walk them away. So if you can use your body, and because it, like I have the Danes here, so they're quite big, so I use my body and I just basically walk them back, walk them away from the window, and just say, stop yelling. And then they back off and they wanna get around you. And the first couple of times, first few times, your dogs will try to go around you, try to go around you. Keep it up, just maintain it. And if you have to take them by the collar, uh, I only have one dog here that has a, um, has a collar on, which is Anthony, because uh, he's quite rambunctious. So what I'll do is with Anthony, for example, when he barks, I'll go up to him and I'll just take him gently by the collar and I'll move him off the couch so he's not up there barking and he'll continue to bark. And then I'll walk him back out into the hallway or to the end of the room, whichever, wherever you are. 
and I'll just walk him out and I'll say, stop yelling. And then I, as I walk him back and as he's still yelling, as I walk him back out, I, I, <laughs> hey, hey, Lord, um, as I'm walking him, him back out, then I say, thank you. Because what's happening is I've asked, yuck, I've asked my dog, anybody who has a day knows what that's like. And uh, I think uh, uh, <laughs> Andrea, uh, who has who had that happen to her. Um, anyway, sorry. Okay. Um, so so what we've done is we've said to our, our dog, stop yelling. And we've walked our dog back. Even if we're forcefully walking him back, even if we're forcefully pushing them back with our body, we're asking them to comply. And just by moving our dog back, they are complying. So in your dog's mind, I'm doing what you told me to do, even though I want to go out there and kill whoever is out there. But, okay, you acknowledge the fact that I've earned my keep. I've earned my position in the family. So when you walk them back, stop yelling. And as you walk them back into the hallway to the edge of the room, good boy, thank you so much, good boy. And you say it in a sincere tone. Don't say it patronizing because you want to maintain the same balance that you had before when you stop yelling, etc. Don't do a lot of talk to them. Don't have a conversation with them at this point. You just want your dog to hear just the key phrasing of commands because when they hear only the key phrasing of commands, they don't hear the extraneous of you begging them to, to comply, of you begging them by repeatedly talking and talking and talking, saying, please listen to me, please listen to me. You're essentially saying, Listen to my command. You did your command. Did my command. Excellent. Now I'm going to reward you by saying thank you so much and giving him a hug and holding his hands, uh, holding my hands firmly without moving it. That's the that's the big part. So if you do that often enough, and you keep going, and you have to be vigilant. You have to continue on and on and on, and it may take you two weeks. And the dogs who have higher dysfunction rates, uh, it may take you two months. But keep doing it. And if you have a reactive dog, bring something to somewhat shield you in case they turn and bite you, right? The, the, the dogs that I have uh, had to step back from the window, they are quite reactive. And sometimes I will actually carry uh, um, something uh, large enough to protect myself because they will usually turn on me and try to bite me. And um, as anybody who has Great Danes, like Colleen and Lori, you know, uh, Great Danes have significant bite strength and uh, they can crush a man's forearm in one bite. So we want to, again, carry something that is protective in the event that your dog is uh, dangerous or extremely dangerous or predatorial. So that way you can protect yourself. And you don't want to use that as a shield to, to, to hit them in the face or hit them or anything. You're using that as an extension of your body, like body armor, and you're just using it to walk them back no matter what. Um, and that's essentially it. So again, dog starts barking, let them bark for upwards of a minute, but 30 seconds no more is the preference. You want to give them the command, and then when they don't stop yelling, you walk over to them, and you say stop yelling, and then you walk them back. If you have to take them by the collar, you walk them back by the collar, stop yelling, and then you take them to the edge of the room, to the hallway. Good boy, Anthony. And you say it with a smile, and you might have a struggle, like with the Danes, right? <laughs> they're they're very powerful, and you get and we can get really quite tired. But if you just do that again, you just take them, you walk them back. Good boy. You spend some quiet time with them, like the hug that I say to everybody that I teach all my clients is to reset them by giving them a hug. Uh, uh, okay, just a second, Virginia. So so then you give them a hug, hold them still, don't shake your hands, don't move your fingers. Keep your hands perfectly flat, still, like robot arms. Don't move it. And then you eventually release them so that they have uh, they have some uh, um, assistance. Sorry uh, about that noise. Uh, so Virginia says, Virginia says, uh, so with three Danes, each one sets off the other. How do you manage that? Well, funny that you would say that. I have three Danes, and they're all reactive, and they're all dangerous to predatorial. So... I do the same part. I go after the one who's there the most senior. So you remember the other day I was talking about seniority? It all see, do you see what I mean? It all fits in to the exact same psychology as a human being. And that's why I say behaviors, PhD scientists, you know, the person who who's who who spoke at Harvard who who has asked me about what I've done, all these things is that they've been looking at it as a science, as a brute force situation. But when we encompass 
the psychology of the dog as a overt codependent, the humans as a covert codependent, it all makes sense. And then I speak about emotional isomorphism, which is my term. Then we have the understanding that the emotional context of dogs in a domestic environment has evolved simultaneously. So when we go with the, dying, the, the three Danes, go with the one with the most seniority. Walk them back. Because then what happens is the next one down the line goes, uh-oh, I'm next. And then they start to back down, not because they're afraid. They're like, oh, I'm going to get in heck, so I'm just going to back down. So they can start reasoning and self-regulating themselves, and then you walk them back, the second one and the third one. Now, if it turns out to be a point where you're not getting that same type of response, right? If you're not getting the same response, then you will go with the one that is somewhat more reactive and walk them back and... Depending on the psychology and the issue and the dynamics of the pack, you'll either go with that one or you'll go with the one that's not making as much noise. But again, the one that's not making as much noise, you really don't have to worry about at all. Uh, this is effective um, uh, considerably, and I've done it with every single variation of the dogs. And I've had six dogs here at one time. And like I said, other than Sammy, who's got two legs only, and she's a Formosa Mountain dog, and she's pretty chill most times, the other five or four dogs have always been reactive. They have always been dangerous to extremely dangerous to predatorial. And again, you know, uh, Nero, uh, you know, uh, William, all these dogs have attacked other dogs or pe and or people. Um, so it's just understanding also the dynamics of your pack, your family. It's the same thing when you're, you know, if you're a manager and you have a staff, your staff is gonna have different personalities all over the place. This guy's like that, this woman's like that, so forth and so forth. And what do you do? You figure out, okay, I got to work with this guy in this way. I got to work, work with this woman in this way. And then you get your whole team working together. So when you start looking at it in a humanistic perspective, it all makes sense. It all makes clarity. And this is why with the barking, I don't use treats or medication, etc. Same with the predatorial dogs like Walter and the same with, um, uh, with Nero Pathway. It's the same aspect. It's just talking to them, dealing with them in a functional aspect of their behavior. Hey, you got a problem? I'm going to talk you off the ledge. I'm going to walk you back, etc. Now, um, uh, I think I, I, I don't want to keep going on that because I think I've done that for about uh, 15, 20 minutes now. And, and I know people sometimes get confused. Um, I want to go over somebody who, and I'm sorry, I'm a big, big head in the thing here. Um, I want to go over someone's... Um, Hey, Lisa, I want to go over someone who's posted here um, regards to their dog. So I'm going to go with this one here. Uh, is reassuring a Dane that is worried barking by saying it's okay? Sorry, uh, uh, is reassuring a Dane that is worried barking? Okay, so what happens is when a Dane is, is worried barking, they're not actually worried barking, right? Because, it, But it's great, Daniel. What I love what you're saying is your language, man. That's what I love because you're, now you're using human terms. Worried. Do you see what I mean, man? Like, like it's beautiful. You got your intuition going. You're talking about your dog, your Dane, in an emotional context now, a human emotional context. So, what is worried barking? So then you're gonna hear the strain and the tone of the voice of the dog barking. If you listen to the way your dog barks, and the people who know their dog that well, you can hear when your dog is stressed out by the way they bark or they whine and they cry. And if you just start listening in a very, very quick manner, you can start hearing the inflections and the tone of the voice. Believe it or not, you can. Same thing when I say to people about using your dog's name, always, always use their name, Anthony, Minky, etc. Always, hi Minky, always use their name. Because what happens is, you, you see the videos, the hidden camera videos for the wolves, are you know at base camp and there's one wolf at base camp and the other wolves are off you know predatorially hunting looking for stuff to kill and bring back and the one wolf at base camp starts howling and out of all the wolves only one comes back to the base camp why is that that's the wolf's name what is language sound when, we're, when I'm talking to you, sound. So reassuring a worried barking by saying it's okay, you're going to say that as well. But when you say it's okay, you're going to use your Dane's name. So again, it would be, for example, I'm going to use a, a makeup name because I don't want these guys to think, oh, something happened. So I'm, I'm going to say, George, 
you're okay. I'm going to land the words. I'm going to bite the words a little bit so that the dog starts hearing the peaks and tones. But because I have control and voice control and I'm acquiring their voice key, the dog hears it being said so it's clear. It's kind of like when somebody doesn't understand, you know, like you have somebody who doesn't speak English and what do we do? You go to the sky train to, right? So this human behavior works with dogs because the dogs are listening to the inflection. They understand the, the, the basic envelope of those tones. So they're understanding what you're saying. That's why I'm saying using human conversation. So you would say, Daniel, you would say again, it'd be George, it's okay. You're okay. And land the word down. Don't go, it's okay. It's okay. You want to lend reassurance to your dog. And then your dog hears it, oh yeah, they're not stressed out, they're not upset, etc. Um, if you go and uh, search, and I'll, I'll try to post this then if someone can remind me, and I, and I apologize I can't respond to everybody because I, I just, um, you know, as I've said before, I'm not really a public person, a bit of an introvert. Um, but, um, so uh, I'll try to find a post about fireworks. And everybody has that part where the, the, the fireworks are going off and most people are like, my dog is just freaking out and, and barking. Or on the more horrific and, and emotionally horrible side is my dog is shivering and shuddering and scared and, and, and shaking and, and afraid. So in the, my fireworks video, you'll see me with five, uh, one, two, three, four, yeah, five, five of them here. Uh, and all the fireworks are going off and you can hear how loud those fireworks are and you can hear the way I'm talking to them. I'm only calming them down because what I'm doing is I'm identifying which dog is starting to be a little bit antsy. And the minute I see which dog is a little bit antsy, I start talking to that dog. Same thing like with the dog barking out the window. I'm talking to the dog that's going to have the seniority, going to have the issue, etc., etc. You have to play it by ear. Yep, I agree. There are different types of barking. Thank you for... Oh, hey, you know, you're welcome. I mean... I might as well start sharing what I'm doing because you know what, if you can save, if you can help someone else save a life, I, I mean, that's, that's worth it. Anybody who knows me, Daniel, um, knows, and, and people who, who know me have seen the dogs that I have. Uh, these are, these are dogs that are, um, you know, uh, will have realistically tried to kill me and it's not fun. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, so so with the barking, the worried barking, etc., it's just essentially saying you're okay, it's okay. Uh, I will explain why I use the word okay. English North America. I was born in Victoria, British Columbia. I don't have an accent because my father figured there was never going to be any Chinese moving to Canada. Yeah, thanks, Dad. So that's why I don't speak uh, Chinese at all, um, which makes it really tough. Uh, but. Um, you remember when you were a kid and you're riding your bike and you fell off your bike, right? We all fell off our bike. And so you fell off your bike, you crashed to the ground, you scraped up your leg and it's just bleeding everywhere. And your dad comes running down to you and you're bleeding and you're crying. And what does your dad say to you? You're okay. If you come up to an accident scene and you see someone who's injured, mortally or critically wounded, you don't know what to do, but what are you going to say to them as you see them thinking that they are going to not make it? You're going to say, you're okay. It's okay. You're okay. This is subconscious language. We use subconscious language so we don't have to consciously think. And if we're not consciously thinking by using subconscious language, it means we can concentrate more intuitively on what's going on with our dogs. How many times have you ever made a decision to do something because you went, oh, and then you went, oh, I better not do it. And then the next day you were like, oh, I should have done it. I knew. My gut told me. My intuition told me. But what happened is, you see, so what our gut is, our gut is our logic. Our emotion is what destroys our logic because our emotion doubts us. And I have a huge theory about consciousness being a development through a logical process into a default of emotional processing, which creates that doubt, et cetera, et cetera. Anyways, anybody, anybody want to talk to me about that? It, it's just... Uh, uh, talking about, anyways, okay. So, um, uh, Annette, I'm not sure what you mean. I'll try Target tomorrow. Oh, oh, what? Okay, I, I, I apologize. I don't understand that. Um, but yeah, so that's what you want to do. Okay, so in my closed group, and anybody is welcome to join, just go to my website, arfarfbarkbark.com. Look for the tab that says help for your dog. You'll see all the screenshots of people that I've helped 
just by reading the descriptions and the photos of their dog, by looking at their pictures. And a lot of people say, wow, that's amazing, etc. But it's something, again, you will be able to do yourself. I might, I might be the teacher and you might be the student, but you will. And my hope and dream is before I pass away in, in a couple of decades, hopefully, that you will be doing what I'm doing with the same proficiency that I'm doing. So this is why everything's done for free. You go to my website, there's no ads, there's no credit cards, there's nothing. I got a donation thing, no one ever donates anyway, so I really, you know, I'm just whatever. But it's all done for free. And if I can keep the ads off of it, I will always keep the ads off. Um, okay, and, which is great, because I mean, my website's been up since uh, April. Uh, Tracy Tien from Kugo uh, uh, Rescue uh, did my website for me, so thank you so much, Tracy. Um, so uh, the website's already got like, 57,000 visits already in, in five months, which is great for just me. Um, okay, so there's somebody who has posted in my group that says, Pearl is an eight to nine year old beagle corgi, uh, or a beagie, okay, beagie, who I adopted in 2013. She was about to be euthanized due to poor behavior. Remember what I said yesterday about, uh, uh, the other day, about behavioral euthanasia? Do you see what I mean? It's such an easy go-to for those who just, you know, all right. So again, we want to get away from that. Okay. So, um, adopted her in 2013. So you've had her for six years now. So you got her when she was about two to three years of age. She's very attached to me and me only. She has fear, aggression, and has nipped and lunged at people, especially men. The vet said she was probably severely abused before I adopted her. She paws at me so much that she scrapes my arm bloody. And we talked about the, the dog, pawing right so that's a codependency issue but it's also can be an interdependency issue it is also a conscious aspect for the dog to actively engage okay so here we go on the next one here um i love her dearly we lost her sister uh beagle uh, roxy to cancer in june since then she's become excessively needy and howls when i while i'm away it's heartbreaking i want her to learn to trust others and feel more secure she also really trusts other dogs she prefers to be alone at the dog park any advice okay so first off right off the bat that we have an interdependency that the dog has it's a non-modular interdependency uh, non-modular inter interdependency which means that she's not able to associate with other people and have a comfortable life with other human beings she can only hang out with mom which means that unfortunately jennifer you've been a bit too codependent for her and her codependency then got pushed into the interdependent aspect, which went boom. And then what happened is because her sister Roxy passed away in June, and, and you know, rest in peace. And I, I, um, I yeah. So rest in peace. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, <clears throat> uh, so when when it comes to that part of it, having her sister pass away, she needs to grieve. Your dog must be able to grieve. So what you can do um, is to put her things out there and let her f establish her own finality of Roxy's passing. She can sense it's there, but she doesn't see it, see her there. So let her grieve through is that process. And because of course she's lost her best friend or one of her best friends, for her she is now going from the codependency aspect of it to the interdependency as in, is there gonna be security? Are you still gonna be here? So that then develops into an abandonment issue. And then she has the abandonment and it's like, holy cow, how do you deal with the abandonment? Well, you have to be a little bit more firm, a little bit more tough love in that sense of it. And you have to make an adjustment to the way that you're actually holding her, petting her and talking to her. So now from what you're talking and how you've written and, and, and your cadence and the rhythm of the writing and all that stuff, it means that you somewhat have been trying to convince her that she's okay. And Daniel, that's different from the okay I'm talking about because that okay is, you're okay versus this part you are uh, uh, somewhat trying to move it up in your tone and you're trying to plead with her because you feel emotionally frustrated of not knowing what to do and because you're feeling emotionally frustrated you're trying too hard and then you're starting not to nag her but you're starting to try to sell her a level of, of, uh, of uh, stabilized dysfunction that is beyond her capacity at this time because she doesn't trust you to be with her um, so you want her to learn how to trust and all stuff. So what I would do on this end, and this is the same thing as the reset that I say for every single person, is to just spend time with her. Just to spend time and sit with Pearl. And don't don't pet her like this, right? Don't keep petting her. Don't keep petting her. Just put your hand on her. 
and every once in a while for Pearl's, for Pearl's specific personality, take your hand off, move it to another part of her body. And when you take it off, Pearl, 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 Pearl. Hey Rita, Pearl, Pearl. When you take it off, Pearl, when you put it down, Pearl. What does that do? So improv wise, as I develop this aspect of, of the training side of here, what that does for her is lets her know that when you're no longer touching her, abandonment, you're saying her name. And then you're reinforcing it by putting your hand back on by saying, I'm back. So you can create an extension, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that'll work out. You'll see if you do that and you don't talk to her a lot, don't like, oh, Pearl, you're okay. Or, you know, hey, you're, you're a good girl. Dad, mommy loves you. Don't worry about that. Pearl, Pearl, that's it. You just want to keep it to the simplicity of it. You want to use her name. You always want to use your dog's name. Because once you use your dog's name, they know who they are. You want to keep doing that part. Um, in regards to her not being able to trust other dogs, she prefers to be alone at the dog park. Introversion. And that's something that has been existent with her before Roxy's death. It's been there beforehand. You just didn't see it. So that means that your nucleus that the three of you had was a very tight nucleus in that sense of you were the go-to person at all times, which again goes back to the intradependency aspect of both of them. And that goes back to the part of Roxy's passing. Uh, it goes back to that part of her leaving without having a finality of loss. So then for Pearl, that circle got smaller permanently. So then she's not able to trust other dogs. And that what you want is a an interdependency. You want her to develop that. And that interdependency will take some time to develop. But in the beginning, just that pearl, pearl. Baby step it. Don't expect to progress any forward motion for two, three, four, five weeks. Imagine how long it would take you to get over Roxy's death. Imagine how long it takes you to get over anyone's death. For your dog, they don't have the ability to cognitively process this. They don't have a consciousness as sophisticated as a human beings. They do have an emotional process. They do have a sentience, but they don't have the ability to process process that. So let her grieve. And how are you get over the fact that you didn't give her the opportunity to grieve initially because it hurt you too much? Is by showing her that you have a stability. And again, we'll go on this part pearl and the pearl and then as we move on you can uh, read and let me know how this is in about a, a few days or a week two weeks whatever just say it in my you know just post it uh, the comment in your post in the closed group and i'll post this link in your 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 post as well because then this way it'll be a lot easier for you to understand than me just trying to type out like i did to christy lee last night and i was just like you know all these things i'm telling her that her dog has some sort of vision issue as well because you can see it in his in his photos um when you when, like the the photo that you have of Roxy, right? You got the three photos: the one where she's uh, looking up at you, and then you have the other one where she's walking on the beam, and then you have the one where she's standing there sideways with her left side facing towards you, uh, and that look of it, which is interesting because then you can see that uh, what is she's a left or right side dog, but you can see that she's a left side dog as well, just by her her paw position, um, and the way she holds her head, and the way she looks at you. you know, if we study the way the dog looks, we can always see what's going on. So that first picture where she's looking up at you in the face, on that part, right, we know that she's waiting for a treat, but you can see in her eyes that she's waiting and waiting for you to tell her something. Don't tell her anything. Converse with her. Have a conversation with, with Pearl. Have a conversation with her. And don't have a conversation where you're answering yourself or you're answering for Pearl. We've all done that. I've done it before in the beginning. Have a conversation with her. Pearl, good girl. Excellent. Let's go this way. Let's go this way. Let's go that way, etc., etc. Have a conversation with her. Uh, did you see the car over there? That kind of conversation as you would with a human being. And then you're going to kick some serious connective butt with her. And you'll find that there's the attentiveness that she's going to have is going to be a point where she goes and strays off to somewhat tentatively say hi to another dog. And then you would at that time, Pearl, good girl, having that conversation. It kind of goes back to 
everything that I'm always saying. But anyhow, um, so there's that, and um, I will get to uh, someone else's um, post uh, on another day. If you, oh, I just gotta turn that off. If you have any questions, um, feel free to to ask. Uh, for those of you who watched for this long, uh, please help me by sharing my posts. Please help me by sharing my YouTube channel, helping me to build up this because I am trying to um, teach the industry that there's a different way. Um, because, you know, uh, when their efforts are only being successful to 60% of the dogs and my efforts are being successful with 100% of the dogs, the predators and so forth like that, uh, I, I would just love it for people to know that they can do what I'm doing. It doesn't make me any more special than any of you. Uh, to the dog trainers and behaviors, to my colleagues and those who have contacted me and asked me for help and evaluations, absolutely 100% I'm here for you. I'm not out here to be competitive with you. I'm not out here to try to take your money away or your reputation away. I'm just out here. Thank you, Lori, for sharing. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. You shared. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so, yeah, I'm not out here to take anyone's business away. I'm not out here to do anything other than to help you help save your client's dogs. By, uh, by lending some clarity to the dysfunctions that are going on as opposed to saying the dog this, the dog that, etc., etc. Same thing like that when the, the vet says, you know, the fear of aggression and so forth like that and nipped and shot people, all that stuff. Um, that part is actually something to do with the leash. Uh, leash control and the anxiety and the defensive measures as I was saying before regards to the barking it all like you, you'll see if you follow me and you keep watching all these all these broadcasts you're gonna find that everything has simple it all comes it all comes down to simple I just take the the complex uh, psychogenetic aspects of everything that I've seen uh, and just process it down into a human format and um, you know like I said, I just read that thing. I hadn't read it beforehand, and it just... You just read it. You just follow the direction. You follow the flow, and etc. And you all can do it yourselves. So if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, I want to thank everybody again for tuning in on a Sunday. And, um, you know, again, if you have any questions, comments, feel free to comment. And there, I'll look through them all and hopefully get another target topic. Or I might just follow through with yesterday's line of thought. But, um, again, any questions... Um, you know, etc. Please share my posts uh, as I was asking and let's change the world for dogs. 6 million dogs are killed annually in North America out of 99.4 million dogs in North America. So uh, if we can change that in dog's life instead of having them go to the shelter then that's better and if we can help our uh, if I can help uh, my colleagues uh, see a perspective that they have never seen before, that is disruptive. It's very novel, of course, but it has interest from some pretty smart academics uh, who are going, well, what's he doing and why is it working and what's his flash, right? You know, we'll talk about all this other stuff later on at another time. But again, uh, just know, talk to your dog, use their name, talk in a normal tone of voice, conversationally, as you would with somebody that you're talking to on the phone. Um, and you won't have an issue. And there's my little Anthony walking by. And Anthony is up for adoption. 18 months, 160 pounds. I am going to post him probably this week. I just keep falling behind on everything. But uh, Anthony is a, an extremely huge love bug. He loves human beings. He's not good with other dogs. But anybody who adopts from me receives lifetime <laughs> training. Anyways, and it's no cost uh, after that. Um, but yeah, so if you have any questions, hey Anthony, hi silly boy. Um, if you have any questions, again, please feel free to post it there. I'll look it through. Um, I won't be able to answer everything because it seems kind of weird to be answering after the fact um, on a live broadcast. But again, yes, Anthony. See, there's Anthony. Anthony, hi silly boy. Hi silly boy. That's how Anthony's big head. <laughs> All right. Okay, guys, take it easy. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Anthony. Okay, so let me just get him out of the way. That's an anxiety aspect. You remember what I was saying about anxiety, codependency, the pawing and all these things? It's all part of it. Uh, we'll talk about that part about jumping up. There's a, yeah, we talk about the barking at the window. So it's a super easy fix now. You see that? It's a super easy fix. There's no need for a treat. If you do feel like giving your dog a treat, give them a treat later on. When it comes to um, dogs jumping up on you, especially Great Danes and so forth, really, really easy way to fix. And when you understand why they're doing it, 
and it makes more sense at all, as well. And I'll explain that at another time frame, how to stop your dog from jumping at you and why they jump at you. And uh, there's a few people who have that in my closed group uh, that have asked that question, you know, and you're, like I say, more than welcome to come in, take a look and see what I'm talking about, etc. cetera. Um, and these guys, Minky, can you stop? See, that was it, just a regular conversation. He stopped being a baby. Minky, thank you. That's it. Okay, guys, take it easy, and I will try to do a broadcast tomorrow. I've uh, have this, uh, I've had sessions all this week, uh, weekend, uh, and tomorrow as well. So um, I'll try to do it tomorrow evening. Okay, thank you all. All right, until we meet again. Oops.